welcome to the latest episode of the Making Lean Fly podcast. And this one's a really interesting subject on inventory entitlement. Um, the corollary to that is it's and optimization, but we'll we'll get into that uh, very very soon. Um, my guests today are Anthony Howarth and Adam Micklin, who I'll get to introduce themselves. The well-known guests on our um, our podcast by now, so most listeners will know them, but we'll. Uh, We'll give them the opportunity to uh, introduce themselves again very soon. Um, and unfortunately, we were supposed to have um, uh, a really interesting uh, member of our team, Daniele Zerati, who's been key to, to building the inventory entitlement model. But unfortunately, due to a bereavement in his family, he won't be joining us. But I want to uh, give him a special mention as he, as I say, has been integral to the development of our inventory entitlement model. And um, really deserves the, the credit for everything he's done there. But anyway, let's uh, let's get going. Um, the abstract for this, this episode is that inventory entitlement is a methodology by which the required inventory investment for the current value stream design is understood, balanced to budget, and then reduced through value stream improvements. However, it is often misunderstood or misapplied, and getting it right is critical to the optimization of inventory. So that, that's kind of the, the surrounding subject matter that we're going to talk about today. And hopefully between Anthony and Adam, we can find out a little bit more about what is inventory entitlement, why we need it, how you can ensure that inventory entitlement is a sustainable methodology, and, and talk a little bit about ownership and some advice on how to really make it a breakthrough in, in this area. So Without further ado, um, let's start with you, Adam. A brief, brief introduction from yourself, please. Yeah, uh, thank you for the invitation, Philip. Um, hi, everyone. So Adam Nicklin, uh, I'm based in the uh, West Midlands in the United Kingdom. I've been in uh, GKM businesses uh, for, for 16 uh, uh, and a bit years now, and uh, I'm currently responsible for uh, enterprise excellence in GKM aerospace through our hosting. We're looking to uh, a breakthrough our approach in uh, external uh, supply chain through uh, supply base uh, all the way to customer and vertically up through our business lines as well. And yeah, interesting couple of weeks, of course, uh, uh, GKN Automotive, where I spent most of my uh, time has uh, been part of the D merger with Dole uh, PLC. Uh, so I'd just like to take the opportunity to wish uh, our colleagues in that venture the, the success they deserve. Excellent. Thanks very much, Adam. Uh, I was worried you were going to do an Oscar acceptance speech. So. <laughs> no, I'll upset it with what I talk about inventory entitlement, I'm sure. <laughs> Thank you. And, and Anthony, welcome. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Philip. So, yeah, just a brief introduction for myself. I'm Anthony Hallis. I'm the Global Lean Leader. Uh, within a couple of weeks, I'll just be coming up on my four year anniversary in, in GKN, uh, 32 years uh, in the manufacturing industry. Um, spending time in aerospace, automotive, healthcare, and consumer electronics. So glad to be on the show again, Philip, and thanks for having me. Brilliant, brilliant, absolutely great. So let's let's start by um, talking about what is inventory entitlement. What what do we mean by that, um, uh, Anthony? Maybe you can start off with that question. Yeah. So inventory entitlement for me really means uh, the amount of inventory that a value stream currently needs in order to fulfill the, uh, the customer requirements. And that's all the way from suppliers, suppliers to customers, customers. So it's really about the amount and the value of the inventory that a value stream would need to have uh, based on, on current day. Okay. So, so we've got a current design. Um, sometimes some might argue it's evolved rather than designed, been designed. Um, but what, what you're essentially saying is that in, in an ideal scenario and probably where we want to get to, this is really a collaborative activity across the customer value chain. So basically customers or customer, ourselves and our suppliers. So really looking at how can we design the value chain to have the best use of inventory throughout that, uh, that value chain. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously the best time to uh, to do this would be right at the beginning of the of the new product introduction. 
Uh, however, in, in GK and aerospace, um, you know, we're actually already pregnant with our value streams in the current, um, well, we could say current design, but I, I think in a lot of cases that they were never really designed to be how they were today. They kind of like evolved uh, coming out of a, a set of decisions that had been made by various people, uh, you know, within the functions that support operations. Um, so we've kind of like these decisions have been made. And as a result of those decisions, we've ended up uh, needing to have a certain level and a certain value uh, of inventory based on those decisions. And, and maybe just to give you an example. So, you know, if procurement decide that they're going to buy some products uh, from a supplier uh, in Mongolia, um, there's obviously consequences to, uh, to that dis uh, decision. It's probably not the easiest place from a logistics perspective to get parts from. Um, having parts supplied line side uh, every two hours is probably not going to be possible. Um, you know, it's likely that minimum order quantities are going to be high. Delivery frequencies uh, might be quite low. Uh, and as a result of that, you might need to, uh, to be carrying uh, quite a lot of inventory uh, as a result of a decision like that. So, and, and it's not just procurement, it's manufacturing, engineering, it's quality, it's supply chain, uh, inventory entitlement you know, really is a team sport and, and all functions really have um, an effect on the amount of inventory that a value stream needs. Excellent. No, that's really, really sage advice that answer as well around, you know, it really being, as you say, a team team activity. So I, I guess before we go on to my next question, because I was going to ask you, Adam, why, why do we need it? But I think one of the things that came out of what Anthony was just talking about was, you know, to me, I, I see that inventory is really an investment, then, isn't it? It's about putting inventory in the right place. Do you see it like that, Adam? Do you see it as an investment? Um, I, I think it's an investment, but I guess the risk with investments, we 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 have a, a potential outcome that can be positive or negative, depending on the amount of diligence that we've put into uh, to place in that investment. And I think the thing that comes out of that uh, and what Anthony said uh, is that, you know, unlike a fine wine, uh, value streams and problems don't improve with age unless unless they've had the uh, the care and attention. And and to Anthony's point about, you know, let's say a decision uh, to to uh, source a, a material from a, a, a far distant country, uh, it may be for uh, the right reasons within that that function. You know, maybe it's a cost decision. But the unintended consequence, if it's not designed as part of the overall value train, uh, chain, is, is a negative impact that we have to deal with uh, within the, the physical uh, operation. Uh, so, yes, it's an investment, but I think it's one of those that, that we need sound advice when we're making it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so I guess, you know, why, why do we need to think about inventory entitlement, um, then, Anthony? Why, why is it important? Well, I think, you know, it's it's linked to your previous question about the investment. If you actually have a look at how much working capital, um, certainly we as GK and Aerospace have got invested uh, in inventory, uh, I actually don't think that we're getting a very good, you know, return on that level of investment. And I guess the question is, could we spend that money on something different um, that gives us a much better return on the investment, you know, and that could be, you know, a piece of, capital equipment that um, that can produce parts to a to a better tolerance to a higher quality level or maybe in a, in a, a smaller batch size um, or whatever so the, the reason that we need inventory uh, entitlement as a model is really to try and free up uh, as much working capital as we've got in the organization so that we can better invest it on other things that give us a greater return you know and that might be as I said a piece of capital equipment but you know, in a previous company that I worked in, uh, cash was freed up to actually go and uh, acquire uh, other companies uh, and obviously uh, growing both the, uh, the top line and the bottom line and, uh, and growing the size of the organisation. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting because I, I don't think that generally, and I'm not just talking about GK and Aerospace here, I'm talking about most companies, I don't think that we, we treat the investment in our inventory in the same way that we would capital investment. So you just talked about a CapEx or, or acquiring another company. We, we probably 
far too often treated as oh it's just some inventory and we need this inventory so let's buy it but that's that's cash out of the business right that's cash that's tied up in now some some raw materials or work in progress or maybe it's even finished goods inventory and um, that we don't get the return on until the customer's prepared to pay us for it so you know reducing that and i think that's what taichi ono talked about when he talks about boiling down lean to what is it all about and he i think he i'm paraphrasing a little here but he he talks about just reducing the time between the outlay of cash and receiving cash from the customer uh, and and that's essentially what we're trying to do in inventory is where a lot of the cash is stored isn't it um during that that lead time between um starting the process and, and delivering to the customer and being being paid so what we're trying to do, I guess, with inventory entitlements is work out what's the optimum level of inventory that we actually need and and then optimising it, minimising it so that we still maintain a very high level of service to our customer, but we minimise the amount of cash we've got to, to outlay. OK, good, good. So so let, let's talk about how we actually do that then, Anthony, because you, you, yourself with um, uh, Daniele, you've been leading our hosting activity that we started in 2022. Um, we, we made some really great strides in 2022. One, one of our sites, Cows on the Isle of Wight, I've, I've got their t-shirt on today in honour of the fact that they're one of the pioneers in this. But maybe you can share with us a little bit what, what you did there, Anthony. Yeah, well, I guess it started off with a bit of a frustration that, um, you know, we seem, it's, it's not an issue that we want to continuously try and reduce inventory, but the reduction should be should be scientifically based. You know, we should know what we need and then we should look at what do we need to do to get to a more optimum level. But I guess my frustration started with us just saying we want to have 20% less inventory than we had the year before. And, you know, we don't really know whether the amount of inventory that we had the year before was actually the right amount. So to try and put some science behind it, we started off trying to understand, you know, based on those decisions that have been made, based on the way that the, the value stream currently operates, how much inventory do we actually need based on uh, the today's situation? Uh, so that's kind of like the starting point. Now, um, at the time, we really only knew from, from our team's perspective, one method of calculating that, and that was through our value stream design and value stream mapping activities. So we set off with the intention of understanding how much each value stream needed by going through the value stream mapping activity. And we soon realized that if we wanted to understand how much inventory every site needed to have, um, that would be a lot of value stream design activities that would need to take place in order to understand that. So during one of the initial uh, sessions that we had, I had the idea of trying to simulate it or try and build a model to help us to calculate it. And uh, at the same time, we had Danny Elizarati with us, who Philip mentioned earlier uh, in the introduction, who's a real expert on supply chain uh, processes, on, on PSYOP and NPS, how MRP systems work. Him and I basically had some discussions around how could we model this? And, uh, and Danielle and I were in a different time zone with lots of jet lag and waking up at ridiculously early times in the morning and uh, and really trying to piece it together. And by the end of the week, and I've got to give Danielle the credit for this, he was the guy that actually came up with the model that enabled us to quite quickly and easily, without having to do the value stream design activity, understand what, the, what that level of inventory uh, needed to be. Um, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. So, you know, if I think about it, we've got this model and I think that's that's great, but we're still going to have to do the value stream design activity to make improvements, aren't we? Or, or does does the act of using the inventory entitlement model already give you some improvement points? Adam, what, what's your what's your view on this? Well, I think the the first thing is is that the 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 answer that comes from the inventory entitlement model um, uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's a good condition, and I think that's the learning point is that you know the entitlement is giving a view on uh, from the current parameters and settings what what it should be at, but you know we're going to have a gap. Maybe we're going to have a twenty percent gap to our, our budget, and and what it will do initially 
is give you some additional problem solving. So the tool will kind of give you an idea of where that, that problem has been generated from. So I guess it's a kind of a first uh, level filter. And then, I, I, you know, for, for me, it's about then using the tools and systems in our lean operating model to determine uh, how we go about that. And I think to, to Anthony's point before, you know, about the, the speed, I mean, we recognise that, you know, in terms of breakthrough, we couldn't do value stream design everywhere. It, it helps us to be a lot more focused to deliver our resources. And then over a period, well, as we know, our value stream design delivers a, a three year map and a, and a six month map. And we have to plan our Kaizen events to deliver that short and long term journey. So it just means that we can you know, leverage and make significant impact through Kaizen events in the short term. So I think it does lead us to the right way. But I still believe that the best way is through Kaizen events and value stream design. OK, thanks. Thanks, Adam. What 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 do you see, Anthony, you know, as you as you did this? Did, you know, I guess there's different steps, isn't there? You you work, run the inventory entitlement calculation. You get an inventory entitlement. You've got a current state of real actual inventory that you can, I guess, compare against that. Yeah. You've then got a budget figure, which again could be different. Um, and then you've got some value stream design activity to try and get all the three to match, so that your inventory entitlement, your current, and your budget are all the same. Could you could you yeah. maybe walk us through that, Anthony? Yeah, so it really is a step by step approach. So, you know, the first step is to really understand how much should we have. Um, and then we can obviously quite easily understand how much do we have. So based on its current design, how much should we have? And then based on the real situation, you know, at any moment in time, how much do we have? And th there'll always be a delta that could be a positive delta or it could be a negative delta. And it's really about trying to understand that. And whilst there might be a delta, you might all already have lots of day to day or week to week uh, variation. So really, the first step is to really try and align how much we've actually got with our level of entitlement. And, you know, I guess some of the learning points through doing that, uh, that I've kind of picked up from cows was they actually noticed quite a lot of errors and problems with the data in the MRP system. They actually found that the MRP parameters weren't actually based on the real situation. You know, so lead times in the system weren't correct, MRQs weren't correct, daily frequency, uh, delivery frequency from suppliers um, wasn't correct. Uh, so during that initial stage, they were really able to reduce the level of uh, variation that they've got by solving some of the some of the smaller problems. So that's really kind of step one. It's really aligning the actual amount with the entitlement amount but the the real breakthrough is when you really try and align this with the budget so the budget should really be set with the inventory entitlement in mind uh, and that wasn't the case for all of our sites uh, so basically you've got your inventory entitlement uh, amount but then you need to compare that to the budget that you've been set for the year and um, in quite a lot of our cases, our budget had been set lower than our actual inventory entitlement. So I guess the, the you know, the million dollar question uh, actually is, um, what do we physically need to do differently with the design of the value stream so that it can operate with a much uh, lower level of inventory? And th there'll always be something that you can do, uh, but you might actually arrive at the point of, you know, diminishing returns. It's not actually worth the the investment that's required to actually drop the inventory to the next level. Uh, you know, but you know, if you think that you could get deliveries from suppliers if they were on your doorstep and um, every 10 minutes delivering line side, your your value stream design or your cell design could all be set up for single piece floor. You could build your own factory right in the um, in the perimeter fence of your customer. So that there's always things that you can do to drop the, the level of inventory inventory to an extremely low level. The question is, um, you know, what what how far do we want to go? Uh, at what point will we get the return on the investment that's required to uh, to drop it? So the next step really is what do we need to do to hit the budget um, and determine through the value stream design activity that Adam alluded to, what are those? Kaizen events, uh, uh, decisions, uh, problems to solve uh, to enable us to do that. 
Yeah. I what what I really like about this, Anthony, is you know, I know, you know, you're making the point that you can make business decisions um about whether you invest further or not. But there's there's two key things that that I really like about what you just described. The first one is that you're not looking at inventory entitlement as an excuse for not hitting budget. You're using inventory entitlement as a scientific way of understanding, okay, what does the current design of the value stream, if we're going to produce and provide the agreed customer service level, what does that tell us we should have? So that's that's the first thing. And you can compare that to what you currently got in your budget and say, actually, is our budget set realistically for where we currently have designed our value stream? The next thing though is, is and as you said, is, is don't then think that that's an excuse not to hit budget. What it means is you might have to put some efforts in. You might have to change the value stream design to be able to hit budget, improve it, remove waste, etc. So that's the first thing I really like about what you said. I think the second thing I really like, though, is you said you can make decisions as to whether you invest further or not to reduce that value stream lead time and hence lower the inventory level. And I think a lot of the time those decisions aren't made using that scientific approach. A lot of the time we we source from a supplier because they're the cheapest in inverted commas, even though they might increase the value stream lead time because we need more inventory, larger lot sizes, larger transportation sizes. It all comes down to inventory at the end of the day. Um, so this can also really facilitate that total cost of ownership type of decision making. And yeah, ultimately you might still decide to deep sea source a particular uh, raw material but at least you're making the decision based upon real data and facts and it's not just a, a single data point decision so yeah i love yeah, i yeah. love the way you you described that anthony it allows us and, to and i, really make I think to, to to add to that philip as well the model that we have can be used to simulate uh, future state scenarios um, and that's what i really like about the model so you know when the team are deciding uh, what are the right actions? They can simulate it back in the model. And if somebody says it would cost X to do that, uh, we can quite easily understand what the impact would be on the working capital. Um, you know, so it's good for decision making as well. But I think the, the ultimate goal for me is rather than sites getting challenged by presidents and COOs on how much inventory they should have for the budget in the coming year, it'd be great if it was the sites that were proposing well, actually, next year we're going to take 20% inventory out because we've got these actions already planned, and it being proactive rather than uh, rather than reactive. Uh, yeah. Philip, Philip, if I can add something as well, and apologies, I, I I lost connection for a few moments. I mean, you know, what, what Anthony's just alluded to for me is about industrialising the process, bringing into your ways of working, and uh, and again, apologies if you've mentioned their friends in Co's, you know, Suzanne. Uh, the supply chain director and their team, you know, have a systematic approach to to reviewing that with a regular cadence as a, as a method to make decisions and change system parameters. So it's got to be kept live as well, a bit like, again, with the value stream design process, it's meant to be a live living system uh, that we're constantly striving towards. And uh, and that for me is the exciting piece about it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very interesting because you start to look at the difference between kind of daily management problem solving activities versus real breakthroughs. So I guess, and you know, if if you, you know, using the examples you were talking about earlier, Anthony, and, and what you just added to it, Adam, you know, if if your inventory entitlement says you should be at a hundred, um, like DIO, let's call it days inventory extended, um, and it says you should be at a hundred with the current design, but you're all already running at 110, then there's really some daily management type of problem solving to go on there because the value stream's already designed to run at 100. So you need to figure out what, what's happening in your daily practices that means that you're not running at 100. Whereas if it says it's at 100, you're running at 100, but the business really needs you to get down to 90, then you're talking about breakthrough activity because that's about how do we redesign the value stream to get to 90. So to me, that's kind of the difference between a daily management type of problem solving and a horsing canary breakthrough type of, of problem solving. Yeah, 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 absolutely. I completely agree with the analogy. Uh, it's about reducing, but 
reducing the uh, the level to the entitlement level and reducing the variation that you get uh, because you know the amount of inventory that you carry isn't isn't completely stable uh, you know and it will go up and down again dependent upon uh, you know MOQs box sizes uh, delivery frequencies and and things of that nature so yeah daily management's really about aligning it to the entitlement level and the breakthrough is really about reducing it to budget it, interestingly, when I presented this topic in our work at the Sustainable Industry Conference last year in Manchester, it really resonated. And, and the word entitlement, three people came up to me in the coffee break saying, I've never heard it described as that before. Can you tell me a bit, a bit more? And that, that, that it, it makes complete sense. And and for me, in terms of thinking, though, it's, it, it, it's just added to, I guess, my, uh, my ability to help uh, our sites uh, to improve their situation. Yeah, absolutely. I think the interesting thing for me as well about that word entitlement, because, you know, I think I think perhaps I coined the term or at least it came up when we had the first horsing discussion, which would have been end of 2021, I guess, October 2021. Um, I think sometimes the entitlement is seen as an entitlement of the business or the site, when actually it's the entitlement of the value stream yep. as currently designed. And that might sound like nuance, but I think that's really important. It's not the business's entitlement. It's not even the site's entitlement. It's the value stream's entitlement. So I think we've got to have that mindset around it. Yep. Yeah. In, in fact, uh, yeah, Anthony and I have got a, a session after this podcast talking about how it can be approached at a value stream level in that granularity or, or an area, as we call it, because it's, it's super important to do so. Mm. Yeah, we, we've spoken in the past as well about, you know, the term entitlement and how it kind of connects well to uh, the credit limit that you might have on your credit card. You know, the intention is that you can have the inventory up to a certain level, uh, which is your entitlement level. But it's also, you know, the same if you were using a credit card, you can only spend up to your credit limit before you need to stop spending. And we, we're really trying to drive that mindset in sites that when you're at the entitlement level, you can't have any more. Yeah. Again, again, it's interesting. If we go back to our earlier discussion around CapEx, um, you know, every year a, a business will budget a certain amount of money to spend on capital expenditure. But what's interesting is even though you've got that budget, you still have to make a CapEx request for every single expenditure, even though it's within the budget. And it still has to go through a quite a rigorous approval process at quite a senior levels for anything above a six figure um, expenditure. Yet when it comes to, you know, operating expenditure like uh, inventory, um, you, you'll get basically people who are, you know, well, not low in the organization, but they're certainly not at the executive committee level who can make decisions on six, seven figure investments in inventory relatively easily even if you're outside budget um so it's it's an interesting difference between how we treat capex and how we treat working capital like uh, like inventory and and i think if we put i think in a lot of businesses if we put a little bit less rigor around capex and a little bit more rigor around um opex or or um you know, working capital, we might we might actually get the balance a little bit better, but uh, that's a that's a personal view. Um, okay, let's um, let let's move on. We I know I've, I've put you on the spot uh, both in previous uh, uh, episodes around the fun facts about yourself, but I did pre warn you I was going to ask you again, so uh, so so you've had plenty of time to prepare. So Adam, I'm going to throw you on the spot. What's yeah. your latest fun fact? video games so um since i can remember with, from my zx spectrum days in the late 80s uh, I, i've always been a big fan of computers but and, and video games and uh, whether it was a commodore amiga sega mega drive nintendo nintendo super nes n64 you know I, I i've been a collector and i've got every single playstation from ps1 to ps5 and my wife doesn't get it uh, I, I probably don't get it really. It's, it's uh, but yeah, in, in my office is uh, yeah, uh, uh, only the latest ones. But I, I, I'm into my video games. I like uh, I like spending time just whiling away the hours, pretending that Wolverhampton Wanderers are 
uh, are doing well uh, via FIFA 20, whatever it is. Uh, so, yeah. So my fun fact is I like video games, but I'm probably not very good. <laughs> well, as long as long as you have some fun with it, uh, Adam. And uh, Com Commodore 64 was my first computer. I used to play uh, Manic Miner on that. I don't know. Yeah. Who yeah, and it was far superior to the Atari ST of the time as well. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Thanks, uh, thanks, Adam. Anthony, what about yourself? Yeah, so um, travel is a massive part of my life, both uh, professionally uh, and personally. And um, I'm probably exposing myself here to being a bit of a geek. But since uh, 2004, I've saved every boarding card stub. And um, and the world record for a physical collection of uh, boarding card stubs is 3,000. Right. And um, and I'm kind of approaching 2,000 now. And if you stack them uh, on top of each other, uh, it probably measures about 18 centimeters. So uh, so it's a massive boarding card collection. Um, I don't expect to be able to uh, to beat the world record, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm giving it a go. And I guess connected with that, another another fun fact is that uh, I've just clocked up 82 countries uh, with a recent trip in February to South Africa, Botswana and Zimbabwe. Nice, nice. So you must be a real pain for the um, for the staff because you get your electronic boarding card and then you go in and insist on them giving you a paper one. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm really disappointed if uh, if I can only get a digital one. If you ever travel with me, you'll notice that I always check in the, uh, the hard way. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. No, I didn't know that about you. Most of the stuff you've shared, I've heard <laughs> from you before. So that that was a, a new one even for me. So uh, that's that's a good one. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Anthony. OK, great. So, right. We've talked a lot about why, why, what, imagery entitlement is and I guess we've covered some of the why we need it but you know it sounds like a lot of hard work Anthony uh, and Adam is it really worth it Anthony is it really worth it well well actually I don't know if I completely agree that it's a lot of hard work it, it, it might do uh, you know when you first set your eyes on it uh, you know but we've got sites that have eliminated waste um, in the process of calculating inventory entitlement, and some of them have even um, semi-automated uh, that process. So uh, a lot of the sites have got a monthly cadence around updating the inventory entitlement model. So as you can imagine, your entitlement doesn't stay static. Uh, you know your volumes, um, you know through your factory, are not completely level from customers. You know so you do get variation in your demand. Um, and as your value stream is always improving, you do have variation um, uh, in your entitlement. So, so some of the sites have really been able to eliminate waste and they've got a really uh, quick process for calculating the entitlement. Obviously, if you're a site that has a relatively simple um, bill of material uh, complexity, uh, whereby you know you might be making a machined component which comes from one casting or one forging or one billet. Uh, if you are one of those kind of factories, then it can be really, really quick and easy to calculate entitlement. You know, if you're perhaps one of our civil sites that are making quite uh, complex assemblies, you know, where you've got quite a, a few levels of um, a few levels in your bill of material, uh, you might have a lot of different parts. Then, then it, it can be quite complex. But like I say, we've eliminated waste from doing that. So that's calculating the entitlement. And then really with the value stream design, all we're really looking at doing is every year refreshing our three year future state map and every sort of 12 to 16 weeks, not redoing, but just refreshing our current state. So the, the things that might have changed in the design, the waste that we might have eliminated or the systems that we might have put in, it's really just about making the uh, the updates to the current state map and making some some subtle updates to the to the six month map, which might be just bringing across some of the Kaizen bursts from the three year map onto the six months map. And we've really connected that with our uh, strategic review process for our deployments, where every 12 to 16 weeks we're stepping back from the detail and really having a look at are we really doing the right things? Are we driving the results? Uh, by doing the right things. 
So I, I don't know whether I'd, if I'd completely agree with you that it's that it's difficult, time consuming or complex. I think once you get into it, it's relatively simple and straightforward. And of course, if it really is delivering the impact that you're expecting, then it's obviously a good investment in the time that it takes. So it's, it's I guess what you're arguing um, in a nutshell is that it's just good rigor and management of your value stream and really understanding how the processes are working. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and to be honest, Philip, I uh, I don't know another way. It's the only way that I know currently. So um, <laughs> I, I do <laughs> think uh, <laughs> I, I I do think it is can be a little bit more nuanced though as well. And and what I mean by that is is that logically it makes sense from an organisation level to be very healthy financially in its performance. And as you go down our tiers you know, from the tier four, a leadership team, tier three to the operations team, tiers two, group leader, tier one, uh, team leaders. You know, it's for me, it becomes more of that balance between the logic and the emotion, the belief. So, you know, the way I look at it as well is that there is work to do. It does mean changing something. Uh, but if you can build the belief in the fact that we're going to have more good days, you know, where we're hitting their targets, we have more time to problem solve and to breathe, not chasing materials. You know, our team leaders with their leader standard work can can be at the gamba. Uh, they can very easily see in the inventory points uh, of the of their uh, area uh, or zone, sorry, uh, and the areas uh, for the group leaders that their inventory points are on on target, on budget. They know the system's healthy. And, you know, we know that we've got all of the important things in place to have a, a really good day. And for me, that means that we become in an industry, a business that, that not only delivers parts to the customer, but, you know, the engagement becomes high. Uh, we're, we're improving constantly and we're growing people, which ultimately for me, uh, you know, if we have a choice, do we want to spend our day surviving or do we want to spend our days thriving? So I think, yes, it's hard work. Yes, there are things to do. As Anthony said, it's a systematic approach, but we have to make it real and believable for each level in the organisation. That's, that's fantastic, Adam. And I, I think what, what's really interesting for me about that is that you, you've kind of started to get to me into a bit about ownership, because I think that it can come across here that this is about supply chain doing management of this in the supply chain management office away from the Gemba. But what you're talking about here is kind of the physical embodiment of what we're trying to achieve, which is to basically ensure that each team leader, each zone has got good control of its inventory, each area has got good control of its inventory, so that the whole value stream is managed in a, in a very localised manner. And I think that's that's really, really important. And I think it's that that kind of building out your value stream design so that you've got that ownership and that physical embodiment is really important so i mean do, do you agree adam is that kind of where you were going with what you were talking about there yeah absolutely we all need to play a part in that and and, and again this is why we have our tier system with our uh, psq dcc uh, matrix people safety quality delivery cash and cost and we want every area of the business and every zone, if they, we want to set up the system. So if every uh, metric is green, that means we're going to have a great day throughout the organisation. And, you know, take inventory. If that's green, because we've designed it well, we know our entitlement, uh, we walk in the floor, we see our uh, inventory uh, is, is managed well. It's one less thing to, to worry about in, in, our, in our working day. So absolutely, you know, supply chain can govern the process. They can work with their supply chain uh, parameters. Uh, but but ultimately, we all are collectively responsible for our, our bit of the business. So uh, for me, absolutely, it's all about that uh, that that ownership ownership throughout the business. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah, and I like what you said. It's the governance. So supply chain are, are governing it. They're, they're governing the process. They can see, I guess, end to end what the inventory entitlement should be across the whole of the value stream. But then each individual person who owns a zone or an area has the, the real ownership, as the name suggests. Oh, it's good. It's 
it's good. I like I like the way. Just one more thing to add as well to that, Philip. Talking about team leaders this morning as well. You know, we want team leaders to own a zone, but their zone is one of multiple zones in an area. So there has to be a customer supplier relationship uh, to ensure great customer service as well. So it actually builds a, a bit of a movement, a collective movement for air success. Yeah, and that's what that's where we talk about inventory points because we simplify yeah. it, don't we? Make it really yeah. simple. You know, you've got an inventory point which is, you know, min one max two, or might be min two yeah. max four, whatever it is. Or in faster moving goods, it might be minimum fifty, maximum seventy. You yeah. know, but you you your team leader and even the operator in that area knows precisely what good looks like, right? It's very easy. Yeah. It's very binary, good or bad, in or out. And, and that makes it very simple. And if cumulatively, we've got all of those where they should be, then we stay with an inventory entitlement. So I guess, Ante, that kind of, that, that touches on something, doesn't it? Because we've kind of talked about inventory entitlement almost as though it's one number. But I guess it's, it's segmented, isn't it, between very simply raw materials, work in progress and finished goods. And then within each of those, you're going to have, a bandwidth, I guess, and min max that it fluctuates between. Yeah, so you, you have to daily manage it, don't you? And like I said, these quantities are going, are going to be going up and down and uh, and you're trying to maintain that level. And the way that we've chosen to do that within GK and Aerospace is to make sure that this is, uh, uh, this is mirrored in the tiered daily management system that we have. So each individual, each team leader and each group leader knows exactly uh, what they should be having in each of their inventory points. And then their, their cash metric, which is directly connected to inventory, which is directly connected to the quantity and the inventory point, uh, is essentially how many of the inventory points within my um, area of responsibility are within the, the min and the max parameters. You know, So if you're a, an operator or a team leader, there's nothing that you can do about the value of the inventory, but what you can control is the quantity that you're keeping uh, within the inventory points within your uh, within your cell, within your zone, within your area, or ultimately within the value stream. Yeah. So again, it gets back to that daily management versus portion canary breakthrough, where daily management it's set, it's agreed. These are the parameters you've got to manage with. Just manage those on a day-to-day -day basis. Whereas the breakthrough is, how are we going to reduce that? Are we going to now take this from min four, max six, down to min three, max five, for example, in this particular zone? So how do we how do we make those breakthroughs in overall water level, as we sometimes refer to it as? Great. Fantastic. OK, well, listen, we're, we're coming towards the end. Uh, I think, as usual, it's been a great discussion, you know, very much missed. Danielli in the discussion, but uh, obviously it's uh, still got two real experts on here in Anthony and Adam. So what I'd like to do is to kind of get your final words in terms of your advice to anyone who wants to make a breakthrough in this area. So, you know, Adam, what's what's your words on this? What's your opinion and advice? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, it, it's actually an example fr from today. I, I think, you know, it firstly recognise the tools and systems that are available to help you solve problems and also seek out support to help uh, with with those. Um, you know, quite often these activities and roles and problem solving can seem quite intimidating, but we, we have people within our team and beyond that have got experience and know how to to contribute that. So I would say, you know, if 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 you want to try it and you're hesitating, then just reach out for help. And there are people within that team that can that can help. And, and I would also say as well, you know, start realistically, you know, making small changes, uh, just, you know, trialing things, expecting to fail uh, and then and then just learning. Brilliant. Brilliant. Sage, sage advice there, Adam. Thank you. And Anthony, your your advice. Yeah, I mean, we've learned a, a hell of a lot um, on this journey. And um, I, I think my advice would be right from the beginning to drive the engagement, really try and make it known that this really is a team sport and it isn't supply chain's responsibility. 
you know, every function, as I mentioned during this uh, this uh, webcast that, or podcast rather, every function has a role to play, um, and and every decision that uh, that every function makes would probably have a positive or a negative impact on the amount of inventory that we need to keep. So the first piece of advice would really be try and make it known that that it's a, that it's a real team sport and everybody's playing a part. And the second piece would really be keep it simple. So in our inventory entitlement model, we've deliberately chosen to exclude uh, certain types of inventory, and that's to try and keep the model simple. We could have quite easily have included uh, all of the different uh, categories of inventory, but we would have ended up with a really complex model um, that would have done exactly what it uh, what it's supposed to do. But I think people would have been scared scared away from it, uh, and rather than wanting to go on the journey, they they would have resisted it. It might be at a certain moment in time that you know we uh, expand the model to cover more different types of inventory, uh, but we've really tried to keep it simple. Uh, we've started with pilots, and again, I would recommend to anybody wanting to do this, start with a pilot, you know, so develop your model, uh, run a pilot in a site that really has a problem to solve, you know, where there's a real appetite for this. Um, and like Adam said, you know, be prepared to fail, but be prepared to uh, to learn a lot on the journey. Um, we started with a pilot in cows, you know, cows has been mentioned a few times on this uh, podcast already. You know, there are pioneers. We did that pilot, I think, in November of 21. Um, took a lot of learnings from that. Uh, keep your value stream design simple um, and really try and operationalize your entitlement by taking it to the floor and putting the inventory controls in place so that in your pilot area, you're really learning about how you can get your inventory down to your entitlement level. And, and try and standardize it as a process so then it becomes scalable to other value streams within the same site and, uh, you know, different sites within the company. Absolutely. No, great, great advice, Anthony. I, I really, really resonates what, what you've been saying there. And I think you make a really good point about the model because a, a model, whatever it might be modeling, is supposed to be a simplified version of reality that allows you to relatively quickly and relatively easily understand it and make a very good positive approximation of what different decisions will will mean and if you make it too complicated you're just making it the real world right and we already live in the real world so so i think yeah keeping it simple and you know enough complicated enough that it's realistic but but simple enough that you can do it quickly and easily is is probably the, the key word there Brilliant. Right. So thank you very much, Anthony and Adam, as always. Great guests on the on the show. Um, this was another really good episode. I think our listeners will really enjoy it. So thank you, everybody, for listening. And it just remains for me to say, remember, it's about changing how you lead, not who you are. <laughs>